So many of you have, have come to my talk on a, on a patent languages forum, microservices. So kind of the goal of the talk is twofold. One is just to reintroduce the concept of patterns and patent languages uh, and actually just sort of explain why they're a good idea in general, but also a, a good idea in, for, for microservices. Um, before I get, get into the talk, a little bit about me. So um, I got my start in programming like way back um, in, the, in the late 80s, building Lisp systems, compilers, runtimes, garbage collectors, um, IDEs, frameworks, and the like. So that was like seven years or so, um, late 80s, early 90s. Eventually ended up programming in Java. And then back in 2006, my book, Pojos in Action, came out. And that was all about building applications with Spring and Hibernate, which back then was sort of revolutionizing enterprise Java development. I think today we sort of take them for granted, even though they were quite revolutionary at the time. And then back in 2007, I started tinkering around with this obscure service known as EC2. Um, that was very much in the early days. And I actually ended up getting into the beta program, created an open source project for provisioning Java applications, which then turned into my startup, Cloud Foundry, which was a Java PaaS for deploying applications on Amazon EC2. And then that got acquired by SpringSource shortly before SpringSource got acquired by VMware. And I ended up working there for four and a half years or so. And now I actually do a couple of different things. I do consulting and training around microservices. And then I also have a microservices startup where we're building a platform that makes it easier for application developers to, to, to write microservices. And there's a whole bunch of links where you can find out more about microservices. There's example code. There's microservices.io, which describes the patent, which is all about the patent language that I'm describing today, my blog, Twitter, my startup, and so on. So anyway, so here's the agenda. So it's like, first off, why a patent language for microservices? What, what, what's the value? What is the benefit in doing that? And then I'm going to spend the rest of the talk describing specific patterns. So like the core patterns, monolithic application versus microservice architecture, um, various deployment patterns. And you're going to see each of them has various trade-offs. And then I'm going to finish up by talking about just kind of quickly running through a whole bunch of patterns, like communication patterns and so on. All right, so let, let's get started. Um, so 30 odd years ago, famous um, computer scientist Fred Brooks, you know, Mythical Man Month and all of that, said that, you know, in software engineering, there's no silver bullet, right? There's no technology that, if we adopt it, is actually going to give us a 10x boost in performance. And that was, that was a long time ago, right? 1986. Yet, 30 years later, you look around the developer community, and developers are still passionately arguing over silver bullets. You know, they, very, they, they typically very firmly believe that their favorite technology is awesome, right? It rocks. And that some other technology, your favorite technology, kind of sucks, right? And you see this sort of dichotomy all of the time in the community. It's JavaScript is awesome, Java sucks, or vice versa, Spring versus Java EE functional programming versus object-oriented programming. And so it goes on. There are just these heated, passionate debates, despite the fact that there really are no silver bullets in software engineering. And if you look at how technology sort of gets adopted and kind of look at the hype curve, it almost always follows the Gartner hype, hype cycle, right? Where in the beginning, there's just sort of some new technology comes out or is finally recognized as being interesting. There's just a massive amount of hype, and it rapidly shoots up towards this peak of inflated expectations, right? And then people actually realize that there are drawbacks to a particular technology. There are various failures because people didn't actually take into account those drawbacks. And then that technology is not so awesome anymore, and it plummets down into the trough of disillusionment. Um, 
And then eventually people figure out that there are trade-offs and they figure out how to properly apply a technology. And it ends up going, you end up going up the slope of enlightenment to the plateau of productivity. And I think you look around, you know, you just look back historically and you see most technologies follow that cycle. And you could say today, microservices is rapidly shooting up towards the peak of inflated expectations. Docker, you know, is not that far behind or it's probably, you know, um, ahead in, in terms of hype and uh, excessive expectations and so on. Node.js has sort of gone up there and is probably going down towards the trough of disillusionment. So things tend to be very hyped, and there's sort of a whole bunch of factors. Some of it's driven by vendor marketing and the like. Um, but you know, one of the fun, un, fundamental reasons that drive this is really the fact that we as human beings are not at our core rational. We're, we're basically emotionally driven. And cognitive psychologists actually like to use this metaphor of a rider and an elephant. So the rider represents, oh, sorry, the elephant represents the emotional part of your brain. You know, it's this big beast that just goes where it wants for the most part. And that's really how we make decisions. We very much make decisions using our emotions. And then you have the rider that attempts to control the elephant, attempts to make it go in a particular direction. And the rider represents the rational part of our brain that really mostly is used to rationalize the decisions that we have already made emotionally. And if you take that model and just look around at technology adoption, you look, at, look around at politics and, and sort of many other d different facets of life, this model actually explains a lot about the world. But despite that, you know, despite the, our fundamental limitation as being sort of emo, um, emotional beings, we really do need a better way to discuss and think about technology. And one solution, I think, that, that's sort of been, been very appealing to me is, that, is actually to use an old idea, sort of a 20-year-old idea of a pattern, right? You know, um, patents became popular back in 1994 with the publication of the design patent book. And if you look at, you know, what, what's the essence of a patent, it's a reusable solution to a problem, right, which is effectively what all technology is. We, we use technology to solve a problem. But where it gets interesting with patents is that it says the problem occurs in a particular context. So it sort of already introduces the idea that this is a solution to a problem in a, in a given situation, which kind of implies it might not be applicable to other situations. So it's sort of you start already starting to recognize that there are limitations to a particular solution. Um, and then where it gets super interesting is really if you look at the structure of, of a pattern, it gives you a great framework for discussing and thinking about a technology. So in particular, right, a pattern has a name, you know, which actually describes what it does, right? Typically, it's sort of an emotive name. It actually has a context, so it, it describes the context, the situation within which you're trying to solve a problem. It actually, the pattern also describes the problem that it solves, right? Then it also describes the forces. So those are the conflicting issues that you're trying to address. And because they're conflicting, you can't always satisfy all of them, right? So that means there's trade-offs. The other part of it, of course, of a pattern is the solution, right? So you've got a problem. This is how it's going to get solved in this particular context. And that actually gives you a resulting context, right? When you apply a technology or apply a pattern, there are consequences. There are both you know, benefits. You resolve some of the forces. You actually leave some forces unresolved. And you actually introduce new problems, which then have to be addressed as well. And I'm going to talk more about that on the next slide. And then there's also the concept of, a, of related patterns, right? So patterns that provide an alternative solution or patterns that solve problems that are introduced by applying this pattern. 
So then, right, you look at the resulting context, right? So you apply a pattern, it has some benefits, it has some drawbacks. And then there are various issues that you have to resolve. So just by framing things as a pattern, we're actually explicitly describing what the drawbacks of, of this technology is, along with listing the issues that you have to resolve when you apply this particular technology. So it's kind of giving us this rational framework for thinking, for, for making technology choices. And then there's related patterns, right? So these are alternative solutions to the pattern which we, we've just, uh, solutions to the problem we're trying to solve. And then there, then there are also other patterns that solve problems that are introduced by applying this pattern. So this actually guides us in, 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 in the right direction, um, both in terms of offering an alternative solution, but also telling us what we now have to do once we've applied this particular pattern. So all these patterns end up forming this web of related patterns, which also goes by the name of a pattern language. And this whole framework of, think, you know, of patterns and pattern languages was actually developed by a real-world architect called Christopher Alexander, who back in 1994 suddenly found that he had a massive number of fans in the um, software community and actually got invited to speak at one of, one of the software development conferences back then. Okay, so that, that's the idea of patterns and pattern languages and you know, how they, they can provide a framework for discussing technology. Now, of course, I should apply that concept to, the, to this idea itself. So we've sort of got this meta pattern that says use the pattern format to describe, to talk about and discuss technology. And the benefits of that, of course, is that it's actually more objective. The downside is that, well, it's less exciting, right? Because we're not just hyping the technology. And the related approach, right, is it's awesome, right? Where here's a technology, it's fantastic, it has these benefits, and I just can't possibly think of any downsides to applying it. All right. So that, that's um, kind of sort of the philosophical part of this presentation. I kind of want to shift gears now and describe the, the specific pattern language that I've created for, for microservices. Um, and you can find this on microservices.io. And you know, this is very much work in progress, right? You know, I'm trying to expand the number of patterns, and sort of gradually it's getting more and more comprehensive. So there are patterns in various areas, right? So there are the core patterns, right, which are monolithic architecture versus microservice architecture. So those are two patterns that are alternative ways of structuring your application. And you can see that they're connected by a dashed line with two arrows, right? So that indicates that those are alternative solutions to a problem. Um, and then once you go down the route of the microservice architecture, there's a set of patterns around deployment. And you can see that the microservice architecture pattern is pointing at them with a solid line. And that's saying, well, you've chosen this pattern. Now you have to start applying these other patterns to solve the resulting problems. So there are deployment patterns. There's also a lot of patterns to do with communication. A microservice architecture means that you've got a distributed system, so you have to deal with inter-process communication. So there are patterns around communication styles. There are patterns around discovery. Um, how does service A find the network location of a service B in order to make an HTTP request? You, there's a lot of work that you have to start or a lot of issues that you have to consider at this point. And then there are also some patterns around data. Each microservice will typically have its own private data store. But then you get into issues that, because you need transactions that now span multiple microservices or, mi or, or data stores, and how do you do that without two-phase commit and so on? So there are patterns that address that. OK, so that, that's sort of a super brief overview of the pattern language. And now I want to dig into the core patterns, which are monolithic architecture versus microservice architecture.
So, you know, let's imagine that you're building an online store. Your typically does architect a system with, you know, three-layer architecture. You've got a presentation layer like the storefront UI that's generating HTML and JavaScript. You, you would have various modules like the product info or catalog service. You'd have a service for dealing with recommendations, another module for dealing with, with reviews and so on. Um, you'd also have one for orders. Um, and, you know, you've got a monolithic database in the back end. You've got a browser client. Um, so pretty much standard sort of web application, right? I'm sure we all build, build apps that sort of look like this. So then the question is, well, how do we, like, package it up and deploy it, right? And then, you know, when making that decision, there's a set of forces that you have to consider. So there's a team of developers that obviously need to be productive. In order for them to be productive, the application has to be easy to understand and modify. You really want to be able to do continuous deployment. You know, you want to minimize the amount of time in between a developer committing a change and that change showing up in production. Ideally, you want to be able to deploy many, many times a day. You want to be able to run multiple instances for scalability and availability. And then you really want to readily use emerging technologies as they become available. You don't want to be stuck using old legacy technologies. So one, one, one approach, of course, is to use the standard monolithic architecture. So in the Java world, that means taking your application components and packaging them up as a WAR file, which you would then run on a server like Tomcat, right? Or WebSphere or JBoss, pick your favorite um, Java application server. And you'd, you'd sort of use an analogous pro approach if you're you know, off in some other language, whether that's Ruby or Node or PHP or the like. So you just basically package your system up as this monolithic thing that you then run on a server. And for the most part, this approach is pretty simple, right? Our tooling is oriented around developing an, a web application. These applications are pretty simple to test. You know, if, if you're in the Spring world or the Spring Boot world, a few annotations on your test class, and it will automatically launch your web application that you can then test its, uh, you, and you can then test its REST API or using Selenium test the, um, the UI. Applications like this are pretty simple to deploy as well. You take your WAR file, you copy it onto a server that's running Tomcat, and, and you're good to go. And they're also quite simple to scale, right? You just run multiple copies behind a load balancer, and you get decent availability and, and throughput. And a you know, totally common example, most applications that I have built over the years have had that architecture. You know, including the original Cloud Foundry. The trouble is, right, successful applications have a habit of just getting larger and larger and larger. You have a team of developers working away, and every day they're adding lines of code to the application, you know, at least, at least when they're not in meetings, right? And, you know, over time, you're going to end up with half a million lines of code, million lines of code, or even more. You know, I once was at a conference where I was talking with someone from a financial services company, and they were describing how they were building a tool that would help them understand the dependencies between the thousands of JAR files that went into their web application, right? You know, applications can get really big. Um, and when, they, when they're big, they, they just, they're sort of beyond human comprehension, right? You can have too many, so many lines of code that a developer cannot figure out their way through a system. They can't figure out the best way to make a change, which interestingly means that the way they make a change ends up being suboptimal, so the design gets a little messed up, and it's very much a downward spiral, right? You end up with a big ball of mud. Um, a large monolithic application tends to be an obstacle to frequent deployments. You, you typically have to have lengthy manual test cycles, and deploying the application is this big, painful process, and there's release cycles that take a long time, and, you know, it's just a total obstacle to continuous delivery. 
you know, a large application is going to overload your IDE, right? The more lines of code you've got sucked into your IDE, the slower it's going to get. Likewise, it's going to slow down your server. You're going to have lengthy startup times. You know, it could be five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Now, if that's part of your day as a developer, having to restart the application server and then wait, you, and you, you have to do that several times a day, you are not going to be productive, right? And then also, it really gets in the way of just sort of scaling your development effort. You can imagine this scenario where you know, the front end developer wants to deploy their changes because they're doing A-B testing, right? Yet they can't push the changes because a back end developer has, has broken the build or checked in something that's not ready to deploy. So it sort of just gets in the, you know, you end up having to have a lot of communication and coordination be between the various teams who are committing changes that are going into this war file. Then there's also a big problem that it really ends up forcing you into a long-term relationship with the technology choices that you made at the start of the project, right? If you have a million lines of code, it's not practical to rewrite it to embrace a new technology. Right? You tend to be stuck with whatever technology you chose at the beginning of the project. So it's sort of like you know, you've got this massive amount of code that's too, that no one really understands. It's implemented using a technology that no one really wants to use. And everything about your project gets in the way of agile development and deployment. So you're sort of in you know, what I've called monolithic hell at this point. Um, you know, if your application is large, it's, this is not a bad approach for, sm for, for small applications. So the, the alternative, right, of course, is to use this microservice architecture, um, which has become, you know, it's a popular term describing quite an old concept. And for me, you know, what, what sort of got me thinking about what are now called microservices is this book, The Art of Scalability, which was written by some people who worked at eBay and PayPal. And it's all about building scalable software architectures and scalable software engineering organizations. And in the book, they have a three-dimensional model of scalability called the scale cube. And it's like along the x-axis, they've got horizontal duplication, which is just running multiple identical copies of your application behind a load balancer. They have z-axis scaling that's running multiple copies of your application behind a router that's looking at the request and deciding which server to route that request to. So in the database world, that translates into sharding, right? And both of those approaches, it's, running, it's basically running the monolith, multiple copies of, the, of this monolith. But then there's y-axis scaling or functional decomposition. And the idea here is, is that you break apart your application by function so you don't end up with identical copies. You have one service that's doing some function over here, another service doing a different function over there. So it's really all, all just simply about breaking apart your application into these independently deployable services. Um, which might be small, they might be large. That, that's sort of secondary. So if we apply that concept to the um, online store, we end up with an architecture like this, where each of the modules of our application is now its own independent service that can be deployed, scaled independently of all of the other services, right? So we've got the catalog service, the recommendation service, review service, and so on. And we've also broken up the UI layer into multiple mini web apps, each one that's responsible for a particular functional area of the user interface. Because um, web apps can actually, you know, the front end can actually get quite complicated. So what's nice about all of this is that, you know, we can scale each of those independently. So we've, we've applied y-axis functional decomposition, and now we can apply x-axis and z-axis scaling to ensure that each service then satisfies SLA's availability, throughput, and, the, and, and so on. So that, that, this is the essence of the microservice architecture, functional decomposition. Plenty of examples about, of this, right? 
you know, these are the sort of the classic, I think actually this slide for me is about four years old at this point, sort of the classic examples of Netflix, right? Their streaming service that keeps my kids busy on a Saturday morning is this incredibly sophisticated up microservice architecture that has 600 different services running on AWS. Amazon itself is a microservice architecture. They talk about how 100 to 150 services are involved in rendering a page. eBay, you know, who were the hot sort of thought leaders in, in software a few years ago, also have what is now called a microservice architecture. And there's plenty of others, right? Um, you know, modern, modern examples include SoundCloud, Gilt, um, Groupon, uh, and so on. Um, but what's interesting about all of these companies is that you know, they did this long before the term microservice was ever around. And many of them, actually, they all went through this phase where they started with a monolithic application. And then, because of the limitations, evolved it into a microservice architecture. There's a bunch of benefits you know, why, of using this approach, right? You're actually breaking up the, what would otherwise be a monolith into lots of smaller, simpler applications that are individually a lot easier to understand and develop. You don't, it minimizes the chances of class path hell, right? And each of these mini applications is a lot faster to build and deploy. It also scales development because these services can be, for the most part, developed, deployed, and scaled independently of one another, right? The team that's working on the front end can make changes and then deploy them without having to coordinate with the back end team, except when there's sort of API requirements, for example. It also improves fault isolation. A memory leak in some service is only going to impact that service and not bring down the entire monolithic instance of the application. And it also, it also eliminates a long-term commitment to a particular technology stack, right? You're creating new services all of the time. And when you do, you can actually look around and decide what technology is available that would be the best fit for that, for, your, for that particular service. So you can much more readily adopt new technologies. You're not going to be stuck with whatever you, you began with at the start of the project. Likewise, when you actually want to make major changes to a new service, maybe that's an opportunity to rewrite it using a modern technology. So the microservice architecture really lets you easily and safely experiment with new technologies. Um, and if you fail, right, you spend three weeks implementing a microservice in, should we say, Haskell, because it looked like a good choice, and you realize that you want to be able to have side effects in your code and monads are driving you crazy, you only wasted three weeks, right? It's not a massive disaster, and you can switch back to using a more traditional language. Um, Though there is something to be said for pure functional code. OK, so, you know, so there's a whole bunch of benefits as to why you should use um, microservices. But then there are some significant drawbacks as well. And sort of you know, overwhelmingly, by far, the biggest downside of microservices is the complexity that you're now embracing at this point. And it actually manifests itself at multiple levels, right? So number one, you're now developing a distributed system. That is complex. You have to deal with things like um, well, inter-process communication, whereas you know, before, service A called service B. That was just a language level method or function call. Now you have to decide, am I going to use RPC or am I going to have to use messaging? I'm going to have to serialize, deserialize um, the, the, the data that's going back and forth. You also have to deal with partial failure, right? When A calls a remote service, B, B might be down, right? That never happens inside a monolith. Either it's all up or it's all down, right? There's no, what, the, the cooler is not up and the cooler is down, right? Um, 
Impl another interesting challenge is you've actually broken apart the database. Each um, service now has its own private data store. Doesn't mean it's got its own database server, but it's got its own private data that's inaccessible to, to other services. And that makes it challenging to implement um, b business transactions that enforce consistency across multiple services without using two-phase commit, which is something we can't do anymore. We also have the complexity of testing a distributed system. You want to test a particular service, well, that might have a whole transitive you know, set of dependencies of all these other services. Does your test case spin them up as well? Right? You know, probably not. You probably want to test using stubs, but the whole testing becomes a lot more complex at this point. Um, and then also operationally, right? Previously, you just had the one thing which was big, and you just ran so many copies of it, right? But it was just sort of the same thing repeated n times. Now, potentially, you might have tens or hundreds of different services that are, that, and so, that are them, themselves replicated. And so from an operational point of view, it's a lot more complex. Um, and then also, there's sort of this irony, right, where Microservices is really great when, you, when you're concurrently developing and deploying the services in isolation. But then when you want to implement a feature that spans multiple services, you actually have to have a lot of com communication and coordination between the various teams and very carefully roll out the upgrades that, um, that implement this new feature. Whereas before, you just had to commit all of your changes into this monolith and then build it and push it out into production. So now, now sort of cross-service feature implementation is, is kind of complicated. The good news is um, that unlike with a monolith, which has this complexity that is extreme, where it's next to impossible to like make go away, most of these problem, or all of these problems, in fact, have some kind of solution, right? There are frameworks for distributed, you know, for, in, in, for IPC. Um, you can use an event-driven architecture to implement business transactions. And then you can just use a PaaS like Cloud Foundry or some Docker clustering solution like Kubernetes to handle the deployment and management of all of these services at, at runtime. So it's like that there are solutions to, 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 to these problems. So for the most part, the benefits of using microservices you know, for a complex application tend to outweigh the drawbacks almost, I, I think, most of the time. So it's good. But you know, if you do decide that you're going to go down the microservices route, you have to deal with, de with deployment issues. You have to deal with IPC issues, um, both inside the system and then from outside the system in. Yet, yeah, you have to figure out how to break up the system into services, which is sort of a non-trivial problem, somewhat of an art form. And then, because you split up all your databases, you've got distributed data management problems. So there's a, you know, you're taking on a whole bunch of these issues that you have to figure out. So I'm going to talk really briefly about deployment, right? So we've, you know, we've applied the microservices pattern. We've got a bunch of microservices that we now need to deploy, right? Various forces that we have to address, right? Services are written using a variety of languages and frameworks. Um, each service at runtime is going to consist of multiple instances for throughput and availability. Um, building and deploying a service must be fast, right? We, we you know, that's sort of a time critical thing. Um, each service needs to be deployed and scaled independently of other services. They also need to be isolated from one another, and you want to be able to constrain the resources that a given service used. And then last but not least, you know, the de deployment needs to be cost effective, right? Because, well, we have, you know, it's going to spend money, and we want to spend our money wisely. So there's a whole bunch of deployment patterns that we can use.
And sort of at a high level, there's two choices. Do we put multiple services on the same host or machine, physical or virtual machine, or do we put a service on its own host and then there are actually variations of host, right? Either a host is e either a virtual machine, I guess it could be a physical machine as well, um, or it could be, as is becoming popular today, a container. So I'm going to just talk briefly about each of these patterns, right? So one option, which is somewhat of a sort of old school, traditional way of deploying things, right? you know, comes from the world where machines are pets and you give them cute names, right, is that you, you have a bunch of service instances and you just put them on the same physical or virtual machine. Um, and those services, they could be individual processes, right? So each one is its own Tomcat or, or whatever runtime you're using. Or maybe you've taken, you have multiple services and you're just bundling them up as individual wars and then they're running on the same Tomcat. Or they could be OSGI bundles running inside the, the same OSGI container. So that's a very sort of traditional way of doing things, right? Which on the one hand gives you amazingly efficient resource utilization, right? Because you, that host machine is actually, an OS is actually shared by multiple services. And deployment is pretty fast, right? You just copy the app onto the machine and you're good to go. Downside, of course, is you actually get terrible isolation, right? They're, in the best case, they're, they're processes that are running on the same machine and you can't really sort of isolate them very well. Um, if they're all running within the one process, then you actually get terrible visibility into what each one is doing, and you certainly can't constrain how much memory or CPU a given service is using if it's all in the same process. Um, so sort of monitoring visibility is kind of challenging. And also, if you're deploying, if you're responsible for deploying one of these services, you, for the most part, have to know that this is a Java 7 app versus a Java 8 app, and it has to be deployed in this particular way. So there's a lot of details that have to be taken care of at deployment time, which is, of course, error prone. So the alternative approach, right, is to um, just package up each service instance as its own, well, to deploy each service instance as its own host. So, and there's two variations of that. So one approach, um, which you say popularized by Netflix, is to take a service, right, take the code, package it up as a virtual machine image, or an AMI in AWS terms, and then at runtime, each service is a virtual machine. So we've got one service, one virtual machine. You know, it's a ver very, very clean deployment model. And this is exactly what Netflix is doing, right? So they've got you know, countless um, EC2 instances. And the AMIs are built with an open source project called Animator. Um, but then there's also Packer.io as well, which is a great tool for building AMIs. So you can imagine just plugging into Jenkins or whatever CI tool you're using, and it builds and tests your application and then spits out a virtual machine image. That, that's kind of nice, right? This approach gives you really, really good isolation, right? Each service instance is running in a virtual machine, and so hypervisors guaranteeing that they really can't interfere with one another. You actually have great manageability, right? You know, because they are separate and you can control each one. You can see how much sort of resources it's using and it's kind of constrained as well by the size of the virtual machine. Also, the virtual machine encapsulates the implementation technology, right? It doesn't really, from a deployment point of view, it no longer matters what language or framework your application is written in. The API for starting and stopping your application is now the virtual machine API. Plus, you can leverage you know, a modern infrastructure like AWS for auto-scaling, load balancing, and so on. Downside is that 
you've got the, the, all of that overhead of a virtual machine for each service instance. Um, so this is actually a, somewhat of an inefficient way of deploying your application, which actually translates into a somewhat expensive way of deploying your application. Um, and I guess arguably the economics of Netflix mean that this is okay for them. It might not be okay for your organization. Also, deployment is relatively slow because you have to build an AMI, which takes time. Then you have to boot up um, that, that instance, which is also relatively time consuming. Um, you know, in sort of this modern age, we've gone from quite happily waiting three months between releases to being concerned about minutes, but, but it sort of really does matter. Um, though there are, there, there are solutions, like there is a company, boxfuse.com, that actually have a super fast AMI building process that builds a tiny AMI that then boots up super quick. So, yeah, so you can actually make virtual machines go a lot faster. But you know, the approach that's getting a lot of attention today is the whole container mechanism, right? It's containers this, containers that. Um, so you take a service, you package it up as a container image, in other words, a Docker container image, and then at runtime, each service instance is a container, and you have multiple containers running on a given virtual machine or, I suppose, possibly physical machine as well. Right? So that's kind of, you know, and you could be using a clustering technology like Kubernetes or Mesos Marathon, et cetera. So that, that's sort of become the, well, the fashionable way of doing things, though I don't know how many people are in practice yet, right? But it's all about Docker. A um, bunch of benefits of that in the sense that there's pretty, you know, you have pretty good isolation, right? Your service is now a container which is like sandboxed um, threads. So it's fairly well isolated. Um, I guess there are some sort of security issues with Docker containers still. Um, you get great manageability, right? Um, it's this thing and you can start and stop it and you've got control over it, which is really, really good. Also, the container encapsulates the implementation technology. It doesn't, like a VM, it doesn't matter what is inside it, right? You just start the container and you stop the container, and so it's like a black box, and it doesn't matter if it's a Java app or a Node app or a Ruby app. Um, and unlike virtual machines, you get very efficient resource utilization, right? The, the sort of the runtime overhead of a container is pretty negligible because all of the containers are sharing the underlying OS, the underlying virtual machine. Um, so that, that's quite good. And you get super fast deployment. So like in my build pipeline, Jenkins takes um, like five seconds to package my Spring Boot application as a Docker container image, right? And I think that's mostly due to the fact that it's moving around like 50 megabytes. You know, there's, there's some, it's just pushing bits around. Um, and then it takes 30 seconds to push it to a Docker registry. And then on the production environment, it takes 30 seconds to pull down that image. So you could say that's like 65, 70 seconds from when, doc, from when Jenkins has actually finished building the um, application, well, from building the war file, to it actually being available to run in production, which is like really, really good. Um, so, but there is a downside. You know, as I mentioned, I, I don't think Docker containers are quite as secure as virtual machines, though I don't fully understand the sort of the subtleties of that. Plus, the infrastructure for deploying containers is, well, it's not as mature, right? Like Kubernetes 1.0, I think, only came out in July, and, I, and for instance, it's getting a lot of buzz. But, you know, I, from my perspective, I, I go look at AWS, and its infrastructure for deploying virtual machines is like way more mature. Um, so there are definitely trade-offs. Okay, so that, that's deployment. You know, you got a bunch of options. Each one has some trade-offs. I kind of want to finish up by quickly reviewing sort of some various other patterns, starting with communication, right? So the whole 
you know, because a microservice architecture is a distributed architecture, there's actually a whole bunch of communication issues that you have to deal with. Um, sometimes they might be taken care of by the runtime environment, so Kubernetes or Ma Marathon will deal with some of these issues for you, but sometimes you have to deal with it yourself, right? So there's both issues around how to clients outside of the application interact with these services, whereas before there was one thing they had to talk to which exposed a bunch of REST endpoints, say. Now there's 100 different services. Do they need to know about them? Who do they talk to, et cetera? Then there's a whole bunch of issues around how do the services within the system interact with themselves? What protocols? Is it synchronous, asynchronous? Etc. How do they even know their, the IP address of a service to talk to? So there's quite a few patterns to deal with this, right? So like, you know, how do external clients interact with microservices? Solution actually is to use the API gateway pattern. Have a gateway server that sits between the outside world and the microservices that functions as a single, single entry point into the system. Um, so that, that's sort of one thing that, that's pretty useful. Um, whoops. Yeah, next thing is how, how do the services within the system communicate with one another? You have a choice. You could use asynchronous messaging. Go find the Enterprise Application Integration Patterns book and, and implement that. Or maybe you use remote procedure in, invocation. So it could be RMI. Um, or ideally something like REST or possibly a binary protocol like Thrift, right? There's a whole bunch of options that you, you have to figure out, each with their respective sort of trade-offs. Um, and then there's this really interesting problem. Service A wants to talk to service B. What on earth is the IP and port number of, a, of an instance of that service? And given the very dynamic nature of the environment, right, it's sort of cloudy or it's containerized and, and service instances are coming and going and they have dynamically assigned IP addresses, that ends up being a non-trivial problem. And so there's a whole collection of patterns around service discovery um, that, uh, that solve those problems. And then, as I mentioned, there's a whole bunch of issues with the database, right? you've decomposed um, the database, and so each service has its own database, so to speak, right? Um, so you've got this database per service pattern, so the order service has its, order, has its own order database, the customer service has its own customer database, and then to make matters worse, they're using different database technologies, right? We're sort of in this polyglot persistence world where you're gonna use a mixture of different of database types, NoSQL, SQL, Elasticsearch, MongoDB, Neo4j, graph database, and so on. So it's sort of this kind of complex database architecture that you have to deal with. Um, but then, you know, so that, that then introduces a whole bunch of distributed data management challenges, right? How do you maintain consistency across these databases? Like, how do I keep my Elasticsearch in sync with my MySQL? Well, that, that's sort of a trivial one. Or how do I implement business transactions that enforce business rule invariance across multiple databases? And it turns out that the, the, a good approach is to use an event-driven architecture, possibly by using an, an architectural pattern known as event sourcing um, as a way of solving these particular problems. So I don't have time to go into all of the details, but, but you know, it's like if you're building a microservice application, you have to think about these things. Um, and some of these issues are, are non-trivial. Anyhow, so that, that's my talk. Um, so in summary, right, patterns and pattern languages are sort of a great way to think about technology, discuss it, apply it, and then in particular, you know, the microservices pattern language is, is a great way to think about microservices, discuss them, and decide, well, are you going to apply them or not? Maybe I should stick with a monolithic architecture, 
or if you go down the microservices route, it tells you the problems that you have to solve and describes the various options that you have for solving them. So thank you for listening. Um, I hope that you found this useful. And please follow me on Twitter or email, send me email. And also check out microservices.io, because um, I'm trying to make that a great resource for developers who want to build microservice applications. So thank you. That was super awesome. We use microservices at New Relic, and I'm always amazed to hear the different awesome. ways that you can do them. So we do have time for a quick question. If anybody has a question, there's microphones on each side of the aisle, so it's kind of a race, whoever gets there first. You're it. I've um, got a question. So with the multiple containers um, on a, in a VM, you said it was is well isolated, but wouldn't like, couldn't a container use lots of CPU and so forth and therefore affect the other services running the other containers? Oh, that, that's a great question. There, there is actually a way of constraining the resources that a particular container uses. Um, so you can like divide up, I mean, I forget the terminology for it, but you can divide up the, the, the CPUs and, and allocate appropriately to a given container. Hi, Chris. Scott Fulton from the New Stack. Uh, Cloud Foundry is your baby. But uh, you've seen it grow and flourish, like, like many a father has watched a child grow. Is it growing in the direction that you would if you were personally steering it with respect to its ability to enable people to use microservice architectures? Oh, that's a really, I, I don't know if I quite like that metaphor, because the cloud foundry that I, kill, that I, that I created was killed off. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my baby sort of um, is no more, and all that lives on. It's a baby with your name on it. <laughs> yeah, and it's not even my name. My wife came up with the name, so I, I can't take credit for that. Um, so it's a baby who's vaguely related to you through your wife. <laughs> You know, I have other ones, though. Yeah. Um, no, sorry, bad joke. We won't go there. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I, I actually have not paid a huge amount of attention to the direction that Cloud Foundry's gone in since, since I left Pivotal a couple of years ago. But on the surface, yeah, it seems like it's going off in a reasonable direction. OK. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> We've got well, time for maybe one more question, maybe two, if they're super short ones. Maybe? Yes? No? Yes? No? I'm going to go with no on that one. There's a little bit of shoulder shake there trying to convince you. But you know, I'm, I'm going to be around, so come up and talk to me afterwards. Yeah, so big round of applause for Chris. Thank you so much.